have your bulletin or your worship guide, you can find on the back. I want to make sure that you know of some things and then much more things for me to talk about. First of all, tonight, we will have our missionaries with us, the Buckleys. I'm looking forward to having them. I hope that you can make it a priority to be here tonight at 6 o'clock as we hear from our missionaries, the Buckleys, to China and tonight, they'll be giving us an update in our service. They'll be taking some questions about the mission work in China as well, and then also giving a Bible message. And I know it'll be a delight for us. I encourage you, if you can, to be here. Reminder that on Wednesday, we'll have our 1030 in the morning Bible study and prayer time at 1030. And then we'll also have a Zoom um, Bible study and prayer time at 7 o'clock. We will have a church business meeting on Sunday evening, September the 13th at 6 p.m. We'll continue to talk about our reopening plans and then also talk about some additions and subtractions in church membership and then also have a send-off for the Murrays. And so they'll be with us. And then just two weeks later, uh, they'll be headed uh, to Taiwan. And so we'll be hearing more about that. Adult Bible Studies Sunday School will kick off next Sunday morning. Now, many of us have gotten used to getting here later than we used to, and I even thought this morning, oh boy, it's even going to be a challenge to get here a little bit earlier, but I want to talk to you for a moment about that, and so if you have your bulletin, I encourage you to follow along. If not, I hope you'll get one as you leave, because it really has some really helpful information. I appreciate Pastor Doug and Tabitha working on this and really giving us a visual of what we're wanting to accomplish in our Bible study times. As we reopen, here's what I want you to be thinking. We're not just simply reopening, but we're reopening on purpose. We are together on purpose. We don't want to just simply be here, and we don't want to simply just do the status quo, what we've always done. Not that what we've always done is not good, but it's helpful, isn't it, for us to evaluate and to look at how, what are we doing and how are we doing it, and are we really accomplishing what Christ desires for his church. And so I don't want to read every part, but I do want to draw your attention to a lot of it. And so if you've got it, you can open it up there. Adult Bible studies beginning next Sunday morning, the 6th. We know it's Labor Day weekend, and, uh, but that's when we'll begin. And then it'll run for 13 weeks. And then we'll reevaluate at the next quarter where we're at and involving children's ministries and those types of things. So you know that Lifeway Baptist Church exists to, one, make disciples, two, mature believers, and three, multiply ministry. So as we think about maturing believers, it's really the focus of our 9 a.m. Bible study time. At 9 a.m., here's our plan moving forward. It's exciting to see how God is maturing believers during this unique time in history. We've said over and over again that Although coronavirus and, and a lot of this has been frustrating and it has not been what we've desired and it has brought great hardship on many, yet at the same time, God is working it for the good of his people. And so with that in mind, we want to see that happen in our church as well. And so regardless of how many ministries we currently offer, it is encouraging to know that God's purpose for the church and plan for spiritual growth has never changed. Beginning next Sunday, the following opportunities will be available at 9 o'clock. There will be adult Bible studies, so you can get involved in several of those that will be available. We're going to go through the book of Isaiah, which Isaiah has 66 chapters. Now, it took me, it'll take me 15 weeks to go through Jude, all right? Jude is one chapter. Isaiah is 66 chapters, all right? We're not going to go through it at that slow speed. That'll be more for the Sunday morning as we jump into the Word of God and we go verse by verse. But here's what we're wanting to accomplish, and you see the picture in there that's really helpful. The preaching service at 10 is more of your up-close look. At our 9 o'clock, we want to have more of a 30,000-foot approach. And so we're getting kind of the big understanding of what is the book of Isaiah all about. And so in 13 weeks... Uh, our prayer is that at the end, we would see change in our own lives for God's glory, but we also would have a good understanding of uh, why was the book written? Who was it written to? And why is it important for me to even know about this Old Testament book? And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't signed up for one yet, 
I pray you will. And you can see people out in the foyer today. To sign. We had a number, a great number of people already sign up. We'd love for you to do that. Here are the different classes that will be offered. We'll offer them just kind of a general adult Bible study uh, classes. We will have nursery. We will have an opportunity for your children up through age five. And then we're encouraging families with children grade one through grade six to be a part of a family Bible study time that we'll have in the gymnasium. And our desire in this is not just simply to have something for the kids, but to equip the parents to walk through the Bible with their children. We are stronger if our families are stronger, right? And that's what we desire to accomplish in that. And so we're not just wasting time. We're not just spending time. We're not just having, hey, what can we have for the kids? We want to walk through it with parents. And so that's something that you can sign up for as well. And our ladies will have their own class as well. So you'll find information there on what to expect when you come in next Sunday. Uh, we told you last week that uh, we will let you know what class you're in. And so we're going to put you into groups whereby you can study the scriptures together and have true New Testament fellowship around the word. The worship hour, of course, will be at 10 o'clock the same time. And during that time, to all of the amens for the parents, we're going to have uh, Children's Church back for ages three and up. It'll be focused more for younger children, but we encourage the older children to come as well. You can help along with your siblings, and if that would be a blessing to you, we want you to be a part of that. Um, so I uh, want to make sure that you pay attention to all of those things. For our teenagers, next Sunday evening, you'll begin with Teen Youth Group next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. So uh, you won't even meet in here. I believe you have pizza planned back in the gymnasium, and then you'll be having time in the gym, and then you'll be turning your attention to the Word of God. Pastor Tom uh, has flyers out in the foyer. I hope you'll grab those and get involved. It's a good thing for our teenagers and I look forward to that opportunity for you as well. What else do I have? It's a couple other things. Thank you for your faithful giving. Uh, we've not been passing an offering plate. I haven't said much about giving, but as you give, there are boxes available. If this is your church and you worship the Lord as members of this church and you're giving, thank you for your faithfulness in that area. I mentioned it last week. I just want to draw our attention again to it this week that this uh, that a week and a half ago, we had a large financial gift given to the paying down of our mortgage principal, and we rejoice in that. About 10 years ago or so, a little over 10 years ago, we were looking at over $2 million, and today, and I don't want to mess this up, so I might be a little bit off, but to the praise of his glory, we're at about 700000 And so we praise the Lord for that. We're looking at about four and a half years left. I know 700000 sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But as I said last week, little is much when God is in it. And if you can't give a check of 270000 but you can give a check by faith for $10, God's big enough. Amen? God will build his church, and he is. And I rejoice in that and look forward to being able to use that $16,000 a month that we put on principal and mortgage to use that for children's ministries and outreach in our community. And what a day that will be. And so to all of that praise as of last week goes to the Lord. As we pray this morning, as we start our service, I do want to praise the Lord that, Na that Nathan and Amanda Ogan have uh, had a little baby girl. We rejoice in that with them. Many of you know that um, a little over a year ago, um, um, they lost a child, and they were pretty far along. In fact, she gave birth, and the baby lived a little while, but uh, went on to be with the Lord. And um, the Lord heard their cry. He heard our cry and gave them a sweet little baby. And so with that, that's a good place to say amen, church. Amen? Amen. Praise to the Lord for that. We're thankful for it. And so let's rejoice with them. Pray for them. I did send him a text this morning, and I said, how's it going, man? And he did not respond. Um, and I think I know why. He probably has no idea what day of the week it is right now. And I know Amanda definitely doesn't, all right? So let's, let's rejoice with them and pray for them, as well as others uh, who are experiencing both challenges and seasons of suffering and also seasons of praise at this time. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We recognize that even in hardship, 
even in the loss of a child, you are accomplishing your purposes in your people for your glory. Those are hard seasons. And yet, Lord, today we rejoice with Nathan and Amanda that they're holding that little child. And there were days, undoubtedly, that they couldn't see the sun because it was dark, it was difficult. But you sustained them, and they've been faithful, and they've kept their eyes on you through those challenging times. Thank you for the gift of life. Lord, we, we recognize here at a church that, at this church, that uh, every, every conceived child is a gift from you. We love life. We're thankful for life. And I pray, Lord, that this young little girl would grow up to love you, to serve you with her life. Lord, again, we thank you for your provision and faithfulness to our church. Thank you for meeting our needs. I'm grateful for every gift that is given. We ought to be grateful for that. And Lord, we pray for your blessing upon those who are, who are obedient in giving. Lord, um, we pray, though, that paying off a building would never be our ultimate goal. But our goal would be the furtherance of the gospel that we're able to do because we're not financially hindered. And Lord, we pray that our singing and our time in your word today would be all about you. Some today have probably come with unconfessed sin, areas of pride in their life. Lord, change us. Change us this morning as we hear your word. May we be open and receptive. Incline our ear unto your truth. In Christ's name, amen. Let's turn to the book of Jude this morning, and we'll spend some time there in the book of Jude. As you find your place, one announcement I failed to mention is that next Sunday morning, following the morning service, we'd like to have a luncheon for our college students. And so if you are a college student, um, or even around college age, and you'd say, well, I'm not currently taking classes, but I count myself a college student age, then we'd love to have you join us. If you just let us know, you can let me know, you can let my wife know, you can let uh, Brother Tony Marvin or Miss Kimmy or... David, Shannon, Kelly, those involved, uh, you can let them know, and we'll have a luncheon for you next Sunday morning right after the morning service. I do want to mention, too, just kind of where we're headed as we talk about the preaching on Sunday morning to let you know what to expect, Lord willing, uh, over the next month or so, let you know where we're headed in God's Word. I, I believe we'll have two messages in Jude after this morning, so next week we'll look at continuing through ministering to the suffering, continuing through ministering to the suffering. And the week after that, we'll close out the book of Jude with a message entitled, A Faultless Finish. A Faultless Finish. And then I'm thinking and praying about doing something a little dangerous. I'm thinking about doing a week or two on the subject of Christians and politics, all right? And uh, I, I let you know I'm praying about it. I haven't made my final decision yet, but I do want to talk about the Christian's role in politics. And uh, God has called me to pastor, so shepherd, and so that means that I do need to speak about those things because God's Word does give us principles and help on those issues. And so we have a lot of opinions out there of what we should do and how we should think, and we want the Word of God to guide our thoughts, right? And so... Uh, we will probably take at least a week or two on that subject. And then after that, in the month of September, as we've mentioned, we will be um, looking at the subject of uh, missions, and I'm looking forward to that. And in fact, um, in the month of October, we're going to have a couple of our missionaries, and I'm looking forward to uh, that opportunity. We'll have Steve Burkholder here with us. Uh, we'll have Ken Fielder with us, some of our missionaries, and also giving out to everyone a new copy of the book that came out from Glow Publications, a ministry here at Lifeway, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, God's Glory on Display. And it's a great, helpful, daily devotional centered on seeing God's desire for missions beginning all the way in the 
first chapters of Genesis all the way to the end in Revelation. And we're going to go through that as a church. And I'm looking forward to doing that in the months of September and October. And so we'll be saying more about that as well. This morning we're, at Jude, we're in Jude, and we're going to read verses 20 and 21. They're verses that we've read the last several weeks. And I'd like to look at them again. As a reminder, Jude is urging the believer to persevere in the faith, to continue to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. There were those who had crept in who were preaching a message that was damaging to the church. It was resulting in people living and let live, do as you want. And he is pulling them back to guard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he tells us in verse 21 this command, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now remember, he's not telling us that we are to keep ourselves saved. We cannot keep ourselves saved. I'm thankful we cannot keep ourselves saved. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we glory in what Christ has done. And we exercise faith in putting our faith in Jesus and in what he has done for us. And he is both the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one who completes this good work of salvation. And yet at the same time, we're to work out our own salvation. We do have a responsibility. And that is, we are to keep our eyes on Jesus. And if your eyes are like mine, they tend to wander. And he tells us in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. This is what Christians do. This is what Christians are called to do. This is our desire to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. And yet I should say this, that our, that our ability, and we've said this several times, we don't want to miss this, our ability to live the Christian life is the result of God's grace given to us and motivating us and empowering us to keep our eyes on Christ. We can't even do this in and of ourselves. Paul said this. He said, the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, uh, one, one pastor said it this way, and this was helpful. The new life Paul had received flowed from his identification with the passion and the death of Jesus Christ. You see, not only are we justified by faith, but we live by faith. The gospel is not just simply a one-time event where we trusted Christ. It is something we ought to preach to ourselves every day. It is the motivation and ability for us to live unto Christ. And it is living, a dy- it, is, it is the reality of that that permeates every aspect of the believer's life. So notice what he says in Jude in verse 20. But beloved, but ye beloved. Remember, he's making a difference between those in verse 19 who do not have the Holy Spirit of God, but you do have the Holy Spirit of God. Christian, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. At the moment of salvation, you get the gift of the Holy Spirit placed within you. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. He is your earnest. So building, here's what we should be doing. Building up ourselves on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. We mentioned last week that that's praying in step with the Holy Spirit's desire as we see in the Scriptures. Verse 21, keeping yourselves in the love of God. And then here's our phrase for this week. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. What is our response to the grace of God? How should we as believers respond to God's free gift of salvation? 
The fact that He saved me. Are you saved? Do you know Christ? Has there been a time in your life when, when you've seen your sinfulness and you've seen the holiness of God and you've seen that God sent His Son, God the Father sent Jesus Christ, God the Son, and He bore your punishment on the cross of Calvary so that you can be forever forgiven? Have you ever called upon Christ to be your Savior, the Savior of your sins? If so, if you are now in Christ, keep yourselves in the love of God. And how do you do that? Well, he's been telling us. First of all, he says, build up yourselves. Spend time in the Word of God. Eat the Word of God. Make it a priority in your life. This is not something that we simply pick up on Sundays, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it gathers dust. We spend time in it. It's important to us. That's what we'll do on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock in these new groups. We'll be spending time in fellowship around the Word, building up the community of the church in the Word. And then he says, praying in the Spirit. Oh, Lord, I want my desires to be in line with yours. Lead me as I'm studying your Word, not, not looking for my own opinions, but guide me by your Word. And I want to pray in step with what the Holy Spirit is praying on my behalf. It's what I need. And then this week, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. One of the most precious realities in all of the world is the mercy of God. I was thinking this week that we most often focus on God's grace, and God's grace is amazing. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, discredit that at all. It is, <laughs> and yet I also want us to consider this that without the mercy of God, there would be <laughs> no opportunity for the grace of God. Because without the mercy of God, you and I would be completely obliterated, right? I mean, think, about, think back to the book of Genesis and to the early chapters. Without the mercy of God, if, if God were not merciful, what would have happened the moment that Adam and Eve sinned? They would have been destroyed. And yet God is rich in mercy. This word mercy, this word simply means this. It's leniency or pity shown towards those who have offended another. The place we ought to begin is recognizing our offense to a holy God. And yet God's mercy was on display when he placed my punishment and your punishment on Christ. You see, without God's mercy, you and I have absolutely no hope. And notice what Jude challenges us to do. Look for the mercy of God. Here's what we're doing. We are spending time in the Word. We're building ourselves up. We are, we are praying in the Spirit, and we're keeping our eyes looking for, anticipating, waiting is really the word for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The word looking means to look with anticipation to wait for the arrival of something. You know what it is to anticipate something. A package from Amazon that is next day aired and it can't get here fast enough. I've even sat there with my phone and you can track it and say it's three stops away. I think, how crazy is this? We've gotten to the point that next day air isn't even fast enough, right? You know what it's like to anticipate or wait for the arrival of a friend, a family member, who maybe you haven't seen in a while, and you're anticipating that, you're waiting for that, or maybe you've saved up for that used car that you've wanted, and so you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you can't wait to sit in that front seat and put your hands on the wheel and say, it's mine. I mean, mine in the banks, but it's mine. It belongs to me. This is, this is, and, and you're anticipating it, or, or what it's like to anticipate the arrival of the grandchildren. 
to come over for an hour and go home. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> to anticipate them coming over of, of what that's like. We know what it is to anticipate. But notice what he's drawing our attention to. The anticipation is for the mercy. It's not even for eternal life. It's focused on God's mercy. God, have mercy on us. He's speaking of an eager anticipation of the mercy of God which will come at Christ's second coming to provide or be culminated in eternal life in its final form. And what a day that will be. And so the readers are commanded to anticipate the mercy of God, which will result or culminate with eternal life. My friend, here's a truth for you this morning. It is only by the mercy of our Lord that eternal life will ever be a reality. It is only by the mercy of God that eternal life will ever be a reality for you and me. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, Titus wrote. John wrote, Behold what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Paul wrote to Timothy to love his appearing. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Let me ask you just to really... It's, it, it's a blunt question, and it's going to hit a lot of us right here. But we need to ask it. Have you anticipated the return of Christ this week? I'm not just simply talking about, I'm sick and tired of this world. Get me out of here, Jesus. No, I'm talking about anticipating Jesus. Looking forward to him. We, we are so focused on the temporal so often, and do you know why? Because we're not building ourselves up in the Word and we're not praying in the Spirit. Because the natural response for those who are, who are keeping ourselves in the love of God is that we would wait for, with anticipation, the mercy of God that brings about eternal life. And it's not a stagnant waiting. We're not talking about twiddling our thumbs and pacing the floor and watching another rerun of the same news outlet. It's active waiting. In fact, John says, 1 John 3, that every man that hath this hope in him, he purifieth himself, even as he, God, is pure. You see, living in the reality of Christ's return makes a difference in the Christian's life. I'm concerned about America. I'm greatly concerned about America. There are many things that greatly bother me, but do you know one of the reasons why I'm not stressed out about it is because my hope ultimately is not in America. My hope is in Christ. And Christ wins every single time. <laughs> he is victorious. Now, I have a responsibility as Americans, as an American, and I love and I will defend, and all of those things are important. But I've read the end of the book, and I know how this ends. And it ends, actually, we can even see it in Jude, verses 24 and 25. It ends with with us being presented faultless, those of us who know Christ as faultless before Christ for all, of for all of eternity, for His glory. It's an amazing truth. And it ought to change the way that you and I interact in the world in which we live. 
And so with that in mind, living in the reality of Christ's return makes a difference in a Christian's behavior. What can we glean from this truth this morning, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life? Let me give you several truths that I think will be helpful for us. Number one, God's mercy is undeserved. Now, I know that we say that all the time, but sometimes, <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever stayed in water too long and you've gotten all pruned up? You know what I'm talking about? We need to soak in truths of Scripture and be greatly impacted by it. God's mercy is undeserved. I think part of the reason why many of us get critical Think about the children of Israel. I mean, Moses, God specifically spoke to, to Moses about the mercy of God. As you think about their, their, their quick murmuring, it was because they failed to recognize that mercy is undeserved. Many times they acted even this, I mean, th there wasn't a lot of difference between the way that the Egyptians acted and the way that the Israelites acted. It was undeserved. It's not by works of righteousness. First Peter 1, Blessed be the God and, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Luke 1, through the tender mercy of our God. Ephesians 2, but God. I mean, that's really the starting point. Ephesians 2, uh, verses 3 and 4, we were by nature the children of wrath, but God. You see, you cannot do anything to deserve God's mercy. He is merciful. And consider this, it will be God's merciful kindness that takes us home. None of us will be deserving even then. As I look around, I see as much nonsense as you do. I see the rioting and the looting and the biased news media, the wickedness of politicians as they brag about their support for issues such as the mur murdering of babies. And I am, I am so tempted to think that only they need the mercy of God, and they do need the mercy of God. But don't miss this. It will be the mercy of God that completes God's work of salvation in my life. That's why I'm anticipating it. That's why I'm looking forward to it. That's why I keep my eyes focused on it. It is only by the mercy of God that I will one day enjoy the presence of God for all of eternity. It's undeserving. I'm undeserving of it. Number two, not only is it undeserved, but we're waiting for it. We're always waiting on God's mercy, in fact, at some level, because anything that he gives us or any time he responds to us is undeserved, right? And, and I want to take a moment and answer this. Why does God have us wait? Have you ever asked, asked that before? It's hard to wait, isn't it? It's so hard to wait. Why does God have us wait? Well, here's a couple quick reasons. Sometimes God has us wait because his timing is perfect and it is not the time yet for him to give us a merciful answer. Sometimes that's why he has us wait on his mercy. God is not in a hurry. And yet when I say that, we sometimes think, well, is he up there just you know, trying to be mean and so he's not, he's not responding to me? What is he doing? No, God's not playing games. He's not waiting to answer us just because. In fact, his waiting to answer us, and get this, is merciful. God's decision to wait on giving us an answer is based on the fact that God is merciful, and he's being merciful in it. He's waiting for our good and for his glory. Romans 8:28. Uh, number two, consider this. Why does God sometimes have us wait? Because more heart change needs to take place in me. Because there's more change that needs to take place. I want to say things like this. God, I got it. 
You're having me wait. Okay, whatever you want, let me figure it out real quick because I don't want to wait anymore. And yet God knows that there's more change that needs to take place in Steve. See, I'm to be more like Christ. And we become more like the people that we spend time with. That's why it's so important that our children and our college students choose your friends wisely. You, you, will, you will be much like the people you hang around. And yet the greatest example of that is you spend time with your God. And you'll find that he's conforming you and changing you. Would you take your Bible for a moment and go to Romans 8? I want to look at a verse that we've looked at maybe more than any other verse in the Bible, at least recently. I want you to notice something here. Romans 8 in verse 28 and then verse 29. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Those are God's people. We know that God is working in the lives of his people. Why? Verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. And there's a lot in there, but I want you to see this that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Notice this, that ultimately God's desire, his plan, what he's doing is he is conforming you to be like Jesus. Christ-likeness is the goal. That's when he receives glory. And one day when we see him face to face, we will be like him. But are all of us just like Jesus right now? Yes or no? Okay? If, if, if you didn't answer out loud, come see me afterwards. I can help you in knowing the answer, okay? None of us are exactly like Jesus. There's still work be, to be done. But notice what he's doing. And we know that all things work together for good. But I want you to get this. It's not the things that are accomplishing the good work in us. Sometimes we may be tempted to say things like this. Well, these things are good for me because these things that God has put in my life, they're accomplishing God's purpose. No, what's accomplishing the purpose is not the things, it's God. God's the one doing it. This is God's work, and he's using things in my life. Is there any hardship in your life right now? Is there any difficulty in your life? Are there any... Don't, don't answer out loud. Are there any people in your life right now who you'd say, God has them in my life, and I wish they were not one of those things? God is merciful. But God may have you in a season of waiting because more of your heart needs to be changed. I think that most of us could attest today that our spiritual progress often takes place most in the seasons of suffering in our lives. Have you noticed that? It's in the season of tears. It's in the seasons of heartache. It's in the seasons of hurt in which you have learned much of God's mercy. I do not know why God sometimes allows the problems to not go away, except that he's working in the lives of his children. And could it be that God has placed someone or something in your life to whom you need to exercise mercy so that you might learn more of the depths of God's mercy in your own life? See, I'm looking at a crowd this morning of people who I think many of you understand hardship. But my prayer is that we are a crowd of people who are learning that God is merciful in our waiting. Then let me mention this. God's mercy is sweeter the longer we wait. 
God's mercy in our lives is often sweeter the longer he has us wait. In the book of Isaiah, a book we'll be in in our study next week, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We're talking about sanctification, this process of waiting. And so keeping yourselves in the love of God, what do we do? We look, we're looking for the mercy of our Lord. Waiting is hard. And our world hates to wait. As we look around and see, I've already mentioned it once, but as we see the rioting and the craziness going on, we can readily see that the world's response is so quick. They don't want to wait for any facts. They don't want to wait for any truth. Just an emotional response. And yet, let me carefully say this. We oftentimes as Christians are just a little more sophisticated in the way that we respond. We respond off of our emotions. And yet the scriptures tell us that we're to do much different. Learn to rest in God's good care. Learn to persevere in hardship. You won't probably run out and smash windows and run around in an emotional fit in your times of suffering. But are you waiting? Are you waiting on the mercy of our God? My last point is this. Recipients of mercy respond in mercy. I mean, God shows mercy without initiation. He is merciful. The fact that God does not consume us is his mercy. But that's really important for me to know because I don't deserve any of God's mercy. I deserve damnation. I deserve judgment. You say, Steve, why do you deserve that? Because I'm a sinner in the face of a holy God. I didn't deserve his grace. I did, not I did not deserve his mercy. And the more that I soak in seeing the mercy of God, how can it not change my response to others? How can it not be how can it not affect the way that we would respond to each other? I say this in all carefulness, but do you know why most of us oftentimes respond with, how dare you? It's because we don't have a proper view of ourselves. We view ourselves so much different than how God views us. And somehow we get to the level of thinking that we deserve God's mercy more than someone else. And therefore, they, don't, they, they should not be the recipients of our own mercy. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servants, Matthew 18, as I have had pity on you? Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful, Luke 6. Luke 10, he that showeth mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. You see, God's not required to show any mercy, and yet he does, and yet I get so angry when someone cuts me off in traffic. Really? I deserve better. A lack of mercy on others is a sure sign of our pride because a lack of mercy on others flows from a misconstrued and dangerous view of ourselves, a view that says, I deserve God's mercy because I am, and we can fill in the blank. And yet here is God's mercy. Psalm 86, 5. 
For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. You're plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. For all who call upon him, he's waiting. Psalm 116, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. And that is a great statement. <laughs> and then I want you to notice this. And we'll look at that, we'll look at this in more detail next week, but I actually never knew this, and maybe maybe you already knew this, but I found this in study as I was studying. In verse 21. For the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that that same exact word, Elias, that same Greek word, Elia, right? Elias. That that same word is found in verse 22. Take a moment and look at verse 22. Do you see it there? It's translated differently in your King James Version translation. Which word do you think it is? Verse 22, and of some have mercy. You see what he's saying? He's saying people who wait on the mercy of God, do you know what they do? They have mercy on others. They have mercy on the hurting. And specifically, he's talking about people who've been affected by dangerous teaching and those who are even unsaved and those who need to be reached we respond in mercy. So in closing, here's my questions. How would a proper view of God's mercy on you change the way you interact with others? How would a proper view of God's mercy on you change the way that you interact with others? Number two, how would your obedience to this verse, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, how would it impact your week? How would it change the way that you approach things? If you this week practice this verse, I'm anticipating the mercy of God unto eternal life. And then I ought to ask this, do you need to respond to the mercy of God in faith today in order to be saved do you need to be born again are you a child of God or are you lost in your sins would you trust Christ today would you call upon him to be your savior if you've never done that in your life if you've never turned from your own way and called upon Christ to be your savior you will face the wrath of God for all of eternity. I'd love to take time and sit down with you and help you understand what Christ has done on your behalf so that you can be forever redeemed a child of God. Not because of who you are, not because of who I am, but based on the mercy and grace of God. That he does not consume me, but he makes me his child. That's mercy and grace. You see, Jesus is the mercy of God, made human. You want to see mercy? Look at the cross. Look at the cross. Let's pray together. Our Father, Lord, I pray this morning that all of us who are your children, this is the gathering of your people, the gathering of the church in this building. And so we're hearing your word, and we're encouraged, and yet we're also convicted. And there may be some here today who they need a good dose of recognizing and seeing and spending time falling down and and seeing that if it were not for your mercy, we would be consumed and should have been consumed already. And yet we don't leave from that place. We don't stay in that place of sackcloth. 
yet we rise from that and we anticipate that you will come again and receive us unto yourselves. And so, Lord, may we suffer well and live for your glory. In Jesus' name.